In the early 1980s, Sue Sharp was ready to embrace a fresh start, leaving behind a turbulent marriage and relocating to the serene woods of California with her five kids. But little did she know, the quiet life she'd hoped for was about to turn into a chilling nightmare. Imagine pulling into your new home, Cabin 28, once the home of a local sheriff, only to have it become the epicenter of one of the most horrifying mysteries in the area. Just five months after getting settled in, Sue's hopeful life would spiral into darkness when a tragic night turned their home into a crime scene. As screams echoed in the stillness, lives would be forever altered, leaving unanswered questions and a haunting search for justice. Originally, Sue, 15-year-old John, 14-year-old Sheila, 12-year-old Tina, 10-year-old Ricky, and 5-year-old Greg all moved into a trailer together. But about a year later, Sue managed to move them all into a cabin in Ketty, giving the family much more space to live in. And it was a good neighborhood, too. Before the Sharps moved in, Cabin 28 was actually the home of the local sheriff, and now it was going to be the place where Sue was going to raise her five kids. Five months went by, and Sue's cabin was alive with the hustle and bustle of young teenagers and growing boys. Ricky and Greg had their 12-year-old friend and neighbor, Justin Eason, over for the night. John also had his 17-year-old friend, Dana Wingate, over too, but the girls were out. Sheila was staying over at a friend's, but Tina was only across the street at Cabin 27. She ended up staying there until about 10 o'clock that night before coming home. Sue Sharp had also been invited out by the neighbors over at Cabin 26. They were Justin Eason's mother, Marilyn, and his stepfather, Martin Smart. Martin was an army vet who now worked as a chef in one of the local bars. He also had an army friend over that weekend named Severin John Bobedy, or Bo, as he liked to go by. It was Martin's night off, so he, Marilyn, and Bo decided to go down to the bar that Martin worked at and get some drinks. They stopped on the way to invite Sue Sharp to join them, but she still had the young boys in the house and decided against it. The smart party then left for the bar, but that was, unfortunately, the last time that anyone remembers seeing Sue Sharp alive. When her daughter, Sheila Sharp, arrived home the following morning, she was hit by a terrible smell. She couldn't tell what it was, but concerned, she walked through the house until she got into the living room. She then found her older brother, John, and his friend, Dana, tied up on the floor and covered in blood. Beside them was a yellow blanket, draped over what seemed to be another body. Terrified, Sheila then ran out of the house, screaming and shouting for help. She ended up returning to the cabin that she'd stayed in the night before and the family there rushed back to the scene. Remarkably, the young boys and their friend Justin Eason were unharmed. They were pulled through a bedroom window to safety while the rest of the neighborhood waited for the police to arrive. The Plumas County Sheriff's Office was the first to respond, but the investigation quickly devolved into complete chaos. Inside, they found the remains of John, Dana, and Sue. Each of them had been bound with medical tape and electrical cords from around the cabin. Sue had been lying under the blanket, only wearing a robe and naked from the waist down. Her underwear had been stuffed into her mouth to gag her. Both she and John had been beaten with the same hammer before being stabbed to death. Both suffered multiple stab wounds to the chest and neck, and it was these stabbings that would ultimately be what killed them. Dana had been beaten with a different hammer, she had been strangled and ended up dying from asphyxiation. Inside the cabin, the investigators found two kitchen knives, one of which had been bent out of shape because of the brute force used behind the attacks. They also found one of the hammers that they believed had been used to subdue the victims. Scattered around the house and leading to 12-year-old Tina's bedroom were pools of blood and spatter. Tina's bed was also covered in drops of blood. It was only then that the investigators realized that there was potentially one more victim in this case. Even though at that point, 
Justin Eason had been trying to tell them for hours that Tina Sharp was actually missing. A wild manhunt ensued, where law enforcement and volunteers scoured the neighborhood. With what had happened to her mother and now that Tina herself was missing, the investigators feared that the motive behind the killings and kidnapping was sexual. It was possible that the people who had done this had taken Tina to keep her alive and to abuse her even longer. This fear fueled the search for Tina, and it also spurred on the investigation. But right in the forefront of everyone's minds was one simple question. Why had the youngest children been left alive and unharmed? Not only that, but all three boys, the two sharp sons and their friend Justin, claimed that they had slept through the night and had not heard the brutal murders happening in the room right beside theirs. Stranger still, the next-door neighbors on the other side of the cabin remembered hearing screams at around 1.30 in the morning. The sound was so loud that they ended up getting up to investigate themselves, but when they didn't hear the sound again, they went back to sleep. Was it possible that the boys really did sleep through the screams that were loud enough to wake the neighbors, or is it possible that there was something else going on? An interview with Justin Eason's stepfather, Martin Smart, certainly made the investigators think so. He told the detectives that both he and his friend Bo suffered from PTSD during their time in Vietnam. In the investigators' eyes, this was one strike against him already. But then Martin admitted that he and Bo actually left the house not once, but twice that night. They first went with Marilyn out to get drinks at the bar that Martin worked at, but they left when they thought that the music was too loud. They all then went home. Marilyn went to bed, and Martin called the bar to complain about the music to the manager. He and Bo then got up and went back to the bar, leaving Marilyn behind. Finding his behavior suspicious, the investigators called all three down to the station to conduct interviews. There, Marilyn told them that she and Martin had separated only days after the murders because he was violent and abusive and he had a vicious temper. That was another strike for Martin. And to put the final nail in the coffin, the investigators had him do a polygraph test. This is where the case would turn again, and, almost unbelievably, it would turn in Martin's favor. Martin passed the polygraph, and then was cleared of all suspicions. He was then allowed to leave town and never came back. In the months that followed, someone stepped forward with another, constantly changing version of events, Justin Eason. He'd first claimed to have slept through the night and not heard anything, but then he told investigators that during the night, he'd had a strange dream. In it, he claimed to have witnessed the murders of Sue, John, and Dana. In this dream, he said that he hid behind the door as two men tied up John and Dana and killed them. Tina had then interrupted the killers at work and they rushed her out the back door as she called for help, never to be seen again. Justin worked with an artist to come up with composite sketches of these men. The artist was a friend of the sheriff's and wasn't actually a qualified artist or the one that the department usually used to draw up witness sketches. When the true state of the investigation came to light, the Plumas County authorities were furious. Not only had the investigators mishandled information, but they'd also let one of their prime suspects get away simply because he'd passed a polygraph test. By then, Bo had moved to Chicago, where he was later caught in a scam that involved stealing money from police officers, but he would die before facing any jail time. Martin, however, was very much alive and had moved out of town. On the way out, he'd stopped in Nevada to send Marilyn a letter. In it, he wrote, quote, I've paid the price of your love, and now I bought it with four people's lives. This letter was never admitted into evidence. With their lead suspects gone, the investigators had nothing to work with. No new leads turned up anything substantial, and 12-year-old Tina remained missing. That was until 1984, when a bottle collector discovered what appeared to be the upper part of a skull about 30 miles out from Ketty. Months later, an anonymous caller left a tip claiming that the skull belonged to Tina Sharp. DNA testing revealed that the caller had been telling the truth. The identity of this caller was never determined, 
and the call wasn't officially documented. It wasn't discovered until years later when another detective found it at the bottom of an evidence box. Martin Smart remained a free man and died in 2000. Shortly after that, the therapist that he usually worked with came forward to the Plumas County Sheriff's Office and said that Martin had admitted to him that he killed Sue and Tina Sharp. That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, I'm the host, and thank you for taking the time to listen. And here's an email from one of you that listens. Joe at 10minutemurder.com is my email address. Hi, Joe, I'd like to remain anonymous if possible, but I do have a question. What is your personal favorite true crime TV show or true crime movie? Thanks. Uh, And that's a very good question. One that I didn't have an immediate answer to. I had to really think about this one because there are so many good ones out there. But the one that I think could be my favorite, Blackbird. If you've seen it, you know that it's fantastic. It's based on the real life events of Larry Hall, who is a convicted kidnapper and alleged serial killer, who, by the way, is still alive today. Uh, And the premise is there's another guy that goes to jail in the, the... They try to recruit him to get information out of this possible serial killer. He befriends him, even though he doesn't really want to, but he wants to reduce his sentence. So he befriends him, tries to get him to confess, that kind of thing. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it's very good. Blackbird is the name of it. Hey, if you're a new listener to the podcast, make sure you hit subscribe right now, wherever you're listening to this podcast and wherever you may listen to the podcast in the future, subscribe there too. Follow on social media. And go to the website if you have anything that you'd like to know about the podcast, 10minutemurder.com. And that's going to do it. That's your episode for today. Thank you so much for listening.